I'm live. I'm live. I'm live, and if you don't get up here, you're all going to be dead. That didn't help, did it? Don't make me quote Moses' favorite verse to you guys. You're rebellious since the day I knew you. You stiff-necked. You better be careful. <laughs> wow. Ah, scary. Yeah. What's that? Oh, that whole thing, you mean? Well, I'm going to tell you, I knew the Lord was speaking to me about that, and I just... It was. What's that? That was the offering today? Yeah, I did. It was really weird, too. I'll talk to you about it later. I think so. I... Did you kill him? Woo! <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere around here, owls are. But, yeah, some people find catch them in snares once in a while. It's just, it's crazy how that can happen. <laughs> By the way, there's nothing illegal about that. You can't do anything about that when something like that happens. You just have to get it out. <laughs> We're live. What are you talking about? We can't delete that. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, but story time's over. It's time to get going here. That's right. Hey, that's in that's in Congress. That rules Congress. That's the spirit that rules over Congress. That's right. All right. Open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We get started here. If I don't start yelling, you guys won't be quiet. So it's like a, you're like a bunch of kids at home. Ah! You just got to. Quiet. Except Brother Paul, he's sitting up there quiet. He's not, he's, listen to him. He's, it's because of the beard, that's why. If you have a beard that like that, Lee, you'd be quiet too once in a while. Yes, naked face Greek man, we understand. My Grecian friend, my Grecian friend. the Romans, the Greco-Romans, right? Is that what they were? Yeah. He made, Alexander the Great made his troops shave. That guy was something, man. And Disney World makes you shave? Only the boys, the girls can keep theirs, right? I'm done, okay. <laughs> Galatians chapter 1, <laughs> we're going to talk about some interesting things today. Um, I'm going to, I'm probably going to split this up until the third hour, and Brother Bicey will, in the third hour, he'll, will sing some hymns, okay? And uh, I think Brother Luke is going to play for us too, and uh, amen. So we'll sing some good hymns together and look forward to that, amen. And uh, then I want to finish this. If I don't get it, we'll see how far I get into it here. Uh, I'm going to keep track of my time a little bit, and uh, but on online we'll just put it all under one file, okay? If we, you know, even if I go to segments here, we'll just put it all into one, so it should be fine. 
sequels don't do too well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. I want you to listen closely. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Look at this. Yep, in verse number 8 he says, but though we, or an angel from heaven, now there are so many, let's pray. Father, we need you, Lord. We pray you bless us now. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it's interesting here. How many times have we heard from cult leaders who come under the guise of Christianity that they received another gospel from an angel from heaven? Right? Joseph Smith, the Seventh-day Adventist founder, Ellen G. White is her name. I know it's a woman. You're probably wondering why all these men follow this woman around. Well, we'll get to that. Um, it's really a bewitching spirit is what it is. And, um, but the title of this message, just so you know, is Seventh-day Adventist founder, Masonic mystic witch or prophetess? Yeah, I left that out on purpose. <laughs> anyway. But the Apostle Paul, he warned that there would come some, they would come into the churches and they would draw men away from them. He says, and of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, drawing men away. In Acts chapter 20, he talked about that, okay? He also said that, uh, that wolves would, grievous wolves would enter in, not sparing the flock. We are always on our guard here by the grace of God for grievous wolves that would enter in. Amen? And perversions of things that could come. And, and, uh, and things of that nature. So we are always on our guard for things like that. As a pastor, I'm always on my guard for things like that. Some people may think I, I overreact maybe, or I go a little bit too far sometimes, or, or whatever. I don't think I go far enough sometimes. That's what my problem is. But, you know, I, I think sometimes I wait a little too long. But I will say this, that as we look at this, as we talk about this lady, Ellen G. White, as we understand who she really is, Say, well, why is this important? Because people are absolutely deceived. When I show you the numbers and the amount of people that are Seventh-day Adventists, it'll shock you. The numbers of people. It's just, it's unbelievable. But the Apostle Paul, he warned about it. He said, hey, there's going to, hey, though we or an angel from heaven. Right. Well, who had an angel from heaven come? Well, Joseph Smith did. Him and his golden tablets and his peak stone, right? And his talisman and all his witchcraft. But he had an angel. He had an angel from heaven, he said, come, the angel Moroni. All right? And I, I believe that. I believe there really is one of those. I, I, I don't have a problem with that. I really believe there probably was a fallen angel named Moroni. I, I believe that. And I believe he spoke to him. I, I don't have a problem with that either. I, I really believe that in this Seventh-day Adventist, this mystical witch here, Ellen G. White, I believe she had a spirit talk to her. I really believe that. I, I really do. Because I, can't tell, I cannot see anything else having that absolute, that much power and that much influence without a devil behind it. Yeah. Because the only thing that has that power is power from God. There's two power sources. You either you have the power of God or you have the power of Satan. But what does it say the power of Satan has? With all deceivableness of unrighteousness. It is the power of deception. It is the power to deceive. What do devils do? They deceive people. And when I show you the facts of where this lady came from, what she was into, and, and what her husband was into, and what, her, what others that she worked was into, you will understand that this lady was nothing more than a Masonic witch. That's all she was. And she seduced many people. And that's what the goal was. That's what Satan's goal always is. 
is to seduce. See, here's what you don't understand, okay? Satan comes as an, as an angel of light. He's not an angel of light. He comes as an angel of light. And what does he do? He deceives. Marvel not, Paul said, if Satan come as an angel of light. Why? Why are we not to marvel? Because that's how he comes. And you know, that is where he's the most dangerous. He's not the most dangerous for an atheist. Come on, do you think Adolf Hitler was an atheist? No, he was very religious. He was a cultic. The popes, they're very religious. Huh? They're very religious. What are they, the most dangerous people in the world? Why? Because that's how Satan's power works. He uses religion. That's why we have to earnestly contend for the faith which is once delivered unto the saints. That's why we have to. Because that's where Satan is his most dangerous. He's not his most dangerous. If you've seen a, a Leviathan serpent flying through the air and it was Satan was shape-shifting flying through the air, you'd be like, uh uh-uh, I'm out of here. He's like, I want nothing to do with that. So what does he do? He comes in a way of perversion. His religious form is that angel of light to impart light unto you, to give you knowledge. Now, I want you to listen to these words because you're going to hear these Masonic words all through as we explain who this lady is and what she did. Now, you say, why go after the lady? Well, number one, because the foundation of all their beliefs is this woman. It's not the Bible. It's this woman. You knock the foundation out, there's nothing left. Don't worry, I'll still deal with all the doctrines because I'm going to show you their false doctrines and their their scriptural perversions and twists that they've done. All right, anyway, I want to take you, I want to, I want to read something to you here real quick from thewayoflife.org. David Cloud did a, did, a, did a great, and I want to give him credit for this because he, he, he has a lot of information on his, on, in his way of life. And by the way, if you've not bought that, that is worth the money to buy the Way of Life Encyclopedia. No, I don't agree with David Cloud on everything, okay? But he, the, the fact is that that Way of Life Encyclopedia is $9.99 uh, for a digital download copy, and you can download it right to your phone. You can do searches, and you can download it to your computer free. You can put it on all your devices for nine ninety nine, and you can search any word that you want to, whether it's repentance. Let's say you want to know something about the Seventh Day Adventism, like like I did, or something like that. Now, this is not the only resource I used. I used many of them, but this one resource there. If you let's say you want to know about the King James Bible issue or anything else, you just type that into that word search, and he'll pull up pages and pages and pages of things. If you want to learn about the JWs, like how did they get found? You type in JW so you get founded. I don't have to agree with the man 100% to know that common sense says it's when somebody gathers all that information there, it's, it's useful and it's biblical, okay, for the most part. Again, I don't agree with everything, and you've got to try the spirits like we said. You've got to test it with the Word of God, and you've got to see what the Bible says, amen? But it is a good resource, and it's $9.99. That is so cheap. I mean, I, for, for the amount of information that's on that. I have a book at home, that same book, and it's about this big. And it's just, it's kind of like it's an encyclopedia. Like if you were going to search out terms, you know, if you wanted to know about West Cotton Hort, you could type in West Cotton Hort there. And man, there's pages and pages and pages about false, false perversions of the Bible. Everything else like that. Historical information that you would try to track down, it would take you a long time to do. But it's all in that reference right there. So I, again, that's not a blanket statement of approval for everything the man says. But what it is, is it, it's a resource that you could use after you've already searched the scriptures, amen, and then go look at that and say, wow, that's a lot of historical information and everything else in it. So just about that. A lot of biblical terms and things that you could look up and everything too as well, cross-references and all those things. All right. Uh, The Seventh-day Adventist denomination arose from the aftermath of the Adventist movement of the mid-1800s. Seventh-day refers to the focus on the Sabbath worship. Adventist refers to their belief that they are the fulfillment of prophecies, pertaining to the latter days remnant and the coming of Christ. So they're the chosen ones. They're the only ones. Nobody else is right. Where have we heard that before? Okay, we hear that. They're the only ones. That, that's it. They're the chosen ones. The name Seventh-day Adventist was officially adopted in 1860, and the headquarters of the denomination was located in Washington, D.C. in 1903. Now, that just why would anybody want to be in D.C.? <laughs> that's just weird. Um, Anyway, the writings of Ellen G. White, 1827 to 1915. I want you to listen to the impact this lady had. The writings of Ellen G. White are exalted as prophecy in the Adventist movement. There are 15 million members worldwide in 61,000 SDA churches. Seventh-day Adventists. 
if I use SDA, that's what I mean from now on, so I don't have to say that whole word out. But, but there are more than 799,000 Adventists in the U.S. and Canada. They are working in 203 countries and 885 languages and dialects. They operate 63 publishing houses, 748 hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, and 7,200 schools. They have more than 1,500 weekly radio and television broadcasts in many languages. More than 1 million students are enrolled in Bible correspondence courses. All going to hell. All being preached a false gospel. All based upon a mystic little witch. I know, some people don't like Pastor Cooley being that blunt about things. It's the only way I know how to be, sorry. I don't want to be any other way. William Miller was the founder of the Adventist movement. So William Miller, he was a Baptist. Isn't that something? Why do all the Baptists have to be the ones that start all the bad stuff? They leave and they apostate and they just take off and they, they leave the Baptist church. They're like, well, I'm a Baptist. Boom, they take off. No, you're not. You were one, maybe. <laughs> Who knows if you're really a real one? But uh, anyway, Miller was the founder of the Adventist movement. In this movement, he believed Christ was coming back in 1844. And the event was called the Great Disappointment. So was, he said, he said, all right, now listen, Christ is coming. I got this date figured out. Christ is coming back in 1844. Well, that event was known as the Great Disappointment because that didn't happen. That's, that's exactly right. Advent, Adventism originated with the disappointed Second Coming Movement of the 1800s. William Miller, a Baptist layman, concluded in 1818 that Christ would return to earth in 1843. When that was proven wrong, he changed the date to October 22nd, 1844. I was off a year. It can happen to anybody. All right? This belief was based largely on an interpretation of Daniel chapter 9 and 12 using the erroneous day-year equ equation, one prophetic day equals one historical year. So that's how he figured it out. Tens of thousands followed Miller's conclusions. Listen, now you hear? Don't tell me this isn't satanic deception. Don't tell me the devil was not just enjoying all of this. Because you're going to see that William Miller was not just William Miller a Baptist. There's a little more to William Miller. Okay? All right. Tens of thousands followed Miller's conclusions, and many diverse, unscriptural Adventists, Advent refers to Christ's coming, groups sprang up within the excited religious atmosphere. Until the end of 1844, Miller held... Uh, to his conviction that Christ would return to cleanse the sanctuary. Okay. Which he interpreted to mean the earth. <laughs> After, I know, it's sad. After the set dates passed, Miller wisely left off with date setting, admitted his mistake, and no longer participated in the Adventist movement. He did not become a Seventh-day Adventist. So he didn't, he didn't progress forward in that. He actually, uh, according to some resources, he, he repented of that. He said, man, I was way wrong. You know, I was just wrong. I shouldn't have done that. And, but listen to this. Estimates of Miller's followers, the Millerites. Now, I have, you know, and I, I didn't have time to track them down, okay? But I actually have some books from that era that were labeled, and they were called the Millerites. And I don't know where they're at. I couldn't find them. I have, I have a ton of pamphlets and everything. And maybe sometime I'll look those up. And if I ever find them, I'll maybe put them online or something in a PDF format or something. And so people can see them. But I, I, I remember having some things with the Millerite on it. And I didn't know what a Millerite was at that time, really. I just, you know, it's funny because you get this, you get all these thousands of books. And it's just like, you know, I, I, I bought this man's library out. who was a, He was a premillennialist. And he had a huge library. And I bought it out. Uh, I bought it from his grandson. And I took all those things and I shuffled them away. And I said, okay, well, I'll look at them sometime. And now I le as I learn things, I go back through that. And I'm like, wow. I didn't know this and everything, you know, that, that that's what that was. So sometimes it's not a good idea to throw away a book unless it's really bad or sell it because sometimes you think that you won't, like it doesn't make any sense to you, but then later on down the road, you remember some things. I remember when I first started collecting books, I threw away a John Huss book. It was, it was a very rare book from, about John Huss. It was really hard to find, and I sold it, and some man bought it over in England somewhere, and I, and I, I just – it really upset me that I had sold it afterwards because I found out the history of John Huss and his stand against Rome and everything and, you know, his, his death and everything. So anyway, but um, 
So the Miller writes, the great disappointment of 1844. It says here that uh, Miller's legacy includes the Advent Christian Church, which is 61,000 members, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church with 18 million members. Both these denominations have a direct connection with the Millerites and the Great Disappointment of 1844. A number of other individuals, which ties the Millerites, founded various short-lived groups. These include Clorinda S. Minor, who led a group of seven to Palestine to prepare for Christ's second coming at a later date. They just said, hey, I got this figured out. It's coming. We're just, let's just all go to Palestine. Okay. Anyway, but there's something you should know about William Miller, okay? William Miller was a Mason, okay? He was an American, uh, this is from the Masonic website, okay? William Miller was an American Baptist preacher who is credited with beginning the mid-19th century North American religious movement known as Adventism. Preaching the impending return of Christ, he began public lecturing in 1831. Wait till you hear some things about this timing because it is very suspicious in how he did all this, okay? Several religious denominations, including Seventh-day Adventists and Advent Christians, have a direct connection with his followers. Okay, so we talked about that great. Miller's exact Masonic history is impossible to determine from available records, they say. So I think they want to lose some of them. They said Miller's exact, it, it, they said that uh, he went inactive as a result of the Morgan incident. Now, what's the Morgan incident? We need to talk about the Morgan incident a little bit. Okay, Captain Morgan, you hear it called. Uh, Morgan was a, was a, was a, um, Morgan was a, a Mason that decided that he was going to out the Masons, okay? And so Morgan outed the Mason, the secret rituals of the Masonic order, and he, was, he, was, wrote, he wrote a book about it, and he was going to publish that book and everything. And then one night, Morgan just disappeared. Um, he was nowhere to be found. And everybody assumed that the Masons got Morgan and killed him and disposed of his body because Morgan was never found. So that caused a public outcry because people started to un people were starting to produce books at that time, and there was an anti-Masonic movement that hit America. Okay, and that anti-Masonic movement that hit America was they found out the Americans found out that Masons were in high level positions in the American government from, from local judges would let people off because they were Masons. They found out books were being written. Um, uh, a heretic named Charles Finney wrote a book. Uh, I call him heretic because I think he is a heretic, but, but uh, Charles Finney, and he wrote a book, uh, although, and, and he wrote a book about Freemasonry. It's actually a pretty good book. I mean, the stuff he said about it was true. Uh, but he wrote a book outing the Freemasons. So everybody was kind of outing them, okay, the Freemasons. And there was like this push in America against it because they knew they were running the government. There was a shadow government in place, and people started fighting it, and they started getting. So there was a lot of anti-Masonic uh, push in that time. So then there had to be a time when basically people had to back up from their open status with the Masonic order and kind of go into hiding with it, or they would have to, by shame, leave the order, not because they wanted to repent of it, many of them, but because they didn't want their character to be besmirched by being a part of the Masonic order. So, but it was still just as dark and wicked as ever. And they just, it tended to push them really underground more is what it did, because they, they just started acting underground more than anything. So anyway, so that's the Morgan incident. You can study that in history. Uh, the Morgan incident, it's, it's, it's amazing when you, when you start. There's more to it than that. I mean, it's a little deeper, but, but, you know, I don't have time to go through all that. William Miller resigned from his lodge in 1831 due to pressure. Miller would resign from his lodge to gain more public acceptance of his new prophecies that he began to develop in 1818 and would cement by 1823, still being a Mason. I want you to understand something. He formed all these ideas that, that he put into concrete that Christ was going to come back in here while he was a Mason. He stayed in the Masonic order, and he preached these public messages and everything. He preached private, first of all, and then he was putting out all this material and forming his, his hypothesis of all these things, and he did that kind of as a Mason, okay, um, and didn't really let people know what he was up to. Uh, he began public lecturing of his New Light prophecies in 1831, the same year he resigned from Freemasonry. Okay, so he resigns from Freemasonry, then he goes absolute public with, with his findings. So he can say, yeah, I'm not a Mason anymore. Yeah, doesn't make a lot of sense. All current SDA doctrine are leavened by the Gnostic education of Freemason William Miller. His, dupli his duplicitous life of adhering to Masonic ritual while 
developing the date setting prophecies are the starting foundation of all SDA doctrines. And you're going to see that when we, when, we, when we show you this. But we'll get into some scripture here in a second here, okay, too. A group of Advent followers in New Hampshire adopted Sabbath keeping in 1844 and began to publish their views through pamphlets. Among these were Joseph Bates and James White. Now, not the same James White, Brother Paul. That, uh, that's not the same James White, but he's just as bad, all right? He's just as bad as that James White. But some of the, okay, so now we get into where did Ellen G. White come in? Where does this lady who, was, who brought millions to this movement, all right, and produced so many things, where does she come in? Well, some of these Sabbath keepers accepted the visions of Hazen Foss and Ellen Harmon. Ellen Harmon, that was her name, Ellen G. White's name before she was married, okay? Ellen Harmon, in relation to the investigative judgment doctrine. Now, we're, we're going to talk about the investigative judgment doctrine. I'm not going to go into it a lot today, but they taught this doc. They teach this doctrine called investigative judgment. I'm going to nail that in another day. But here's what they say, basically. Well, Jesus went in in like 1844, and he looked at the record books, okay? And he's checking out the record books to see whether you've been naughty or nice, okay? So if you, if, you haven't been, if you haven't been good and you've been bad, then you're not saved. You're not going to be saved if you've sinned, and you're going to end up going, well, they don't believe in hell. So you end up just like sleeping, right, or annihilation or something? Yeah, both. Yeah, sleep, annihilation. Yeah, that's what they believe. They don't believe in hell either. So anyway, isn't that something? What would you tell somebody that didn't believe? Well, how, how would that impact if there was no hell? Right, we're going to talk about that uh, because there was a movement that went on, of, an, an annihilation movement that went on in that time in America. It was huge. We're not going to talk about that today. However, their investigative judgment doctrine said this, that you know what, you can't really know if you're saved until the end. You better do good works and you better live right because you won't know until Jesus looks at the record books. And that's pretty much the gist of it. And then so you can never really know that you're saved. You have to be almost perfect. Now, Brother Paul, we'd be in trouble. We'd be in a lot of trouble, wouldn't we? You know, we, yeah, we, yeah, it is works. That's what it is. See the damnable heresy? Do you see it? It's not that, hey, a saving faith works. That's not what she's saying. She's putting the onus on you to do good works by your own power, not by the power of God to change you and make you a new creature. It's different. Hear the hiss of the serpent? And the third angel message, the doctrine of investigative judgment is taught by the SDA claims that in 1844, Christ entered into the heavenly holy of holies to begin investigating the records of human works. It is supposed that this investigation will decide the eternal destinies of, of all men. Yeah, and it just so happens that he picked 1844 for some reason. I don't know why. It just, I mean, she had a vision. Maybe she ate too many nachos. I don't know. But she had this vision and all of a sudden, hey, it's 1844. That's what it's going to be. I, I'm trying to figure out how sane people can follow that. I, I really, like, where, could you show me that 1844 in here somewhere where it says that's going to happen in 1844? Then you have all these effeminate men in the Seventh-day Adventist movement that follow her and they believe it. Well, yeah, in 1844 he entered in, in, in the, okay, the record books, huh? Okay. Where's that at here? Not in there. The third message, which is a warning against taking the mark of the beast and speaks of they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, was erroneously taken by the Adventists to the SDA people to refer to themselves since they uphold the Sabbath. So here's what they said, okay? Uh, here's, here's the other thing. They say, they, they say that the mark of the beast is Sunday. If you worship on Sunday, that's the mark of the beast. How, can somebody explain to me how you put Sunday in your right hand or your forehead? I just would like somebody to show me that. What, what's that? Okay, well, it doesn't say that, though, does it? It doesn't say that Sunday is in your hand and in your forehead, in the Bible, anywhere. So they make it up. That's, they make it up. Near the time of the expected advent in the fall of 1844, there was also given to Hazen Foss, a young advent uh, SDA of talent, a revelation of the experience of the advent people. 
Shortly after the passing of time, of the time he was bidden to relate the vision to others. But this he did, he did, he declined. He didn't do it. Okay. So he was supposed to, he had a vision, he said, and he was supposed to show it to everybody and tell everybody about his vision. But he didn't do it. He was warned of God as to the consequence of failing to relate to others what had been revealed to him and was told that if he refused, the light would be given to someone else. But he felt keenly the disappointment of 1844 and said that he had been deceived. After a severe mental conflict, he decided he would not relate the visions. Then very strange feelings came to him and a voice said, you have grieved away the spirit of the Lord. Horrified at his stubbornness and rebellion, he told the Lord that he would relate the visions, but when he attempted to do so before a company of believers, he could not call it to mind. In vain were his attempts to call up the scenes as they had been shown to him, and then in deep despair he exclaimed, It is gone from me, I can say nothing, and the Spirit of the Lord has left me. Eyewitnesses described it as the most terrible meeting they, ever, they were ever in. Okay, now, let me help you out with something. When Jonah was a disobedient prophet and he went into Nineveh, or he wouldn't go into Nineveh, but he went the other way, did God say that you're no longer a prophet, I'm going to take it away from you, and, you, and you're not going to speak my word anymore? What did he do? Well, he repented. God stuck him in that belly of the whale. Hey, Ben. And he repented, and he said, Now, boy, I told you, go to Nineveh. That's how God deals with his prophets. Why? Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. That's right. Amen. Anyway, so early in 1845, Foss overheard Ellen Harmon relate her first vision to the company of believers at Portland, Maine. So she had some visions. He recognized her account as a description of what he was shown him. Wait a minute. I thought he couldn't remember what was shown him. How'd that happen? Come on. All right. She reminded him. He recognized her account as a description of what was shown him. Upon meeting her the next morning, he recounted his experience. You see that how this is? He recounted his experience. It's always experience. experience. It's not what's in the Word of God. It's not by faith in Christ Jesus. It's not according to the Scriptures. It's their experience. Upon meeting her the next morning, he recounted his experience of which she had not before known and encouraged her to faithfully perform her work stating, I believe the visions are taken from me and given to you. Do not refuse to obey God, for it will be at the peril of your soul. I am a lost man. You are chosen of God. Be faithful in doing your work, and the crown I might have had, you will receive. Okay, why don't you stop there for a second. So here's a lady. Here's a guy that says he's a lost man. Okay, and he is. Okay, so here's a lost man coming up to some lady that has these visions, right? And he's telling her, now listen, I'm a lost man. Let me give you some spiritual advice. From God. I got to tell you something. I mean, okay, come on. Um, is, it, is there not, is this like the oddest thing you've ever heard in your life? I know I'm going to be, there's going to be like a ton of hate mail over all this, but I'm just saying, I can't help it, man. It's just too, this is too easy, all right? It's just too easy. I mean, come on. Seriously. I'm a lost man. Let me tell you how to find God. Okay, sounds great. <laughs> you are chosen of God. Be faithful in doing your work. And the crown I might have had, you will receive. I, I know he's a lost man. I don't know. He's just. Do you see how none of the. Now, have you heard anything about God's word there? No. Why? Because it's not about God's word. It's about their feeling, their emotion, their sign, their wonder. And, and their lostness, right? On comparing dates, they discovered... Now listen, then they started comparing dates. They sat down and said, hey. On comparing dates, they discovered that it was not until after he had been told that the visions were taken from him that Ellen Harmon was given her first revelation. I agree. I think the devil that was on you went to her. I have no problem with that. I agree with you. I think that did happen. Although Hazen Foss lived till 1893, he never again manifested interest in matters religious. 
doesn't care anymore. He's done. He's lost, man. Okay, and that, by the way, that's from The Messenger to the Remnant by Arthur L. White and Ellen G. White, just so you know. In the year 1844, there was a group of Advent believers among whom was manifested the gift of prophecy. The agent of the gift, Ellen Harmon, was called to service in 1844. Later, those associated with this gift came in contact with the Bible teaching already referred to to the truths of the Sabbath and of the heavenly sanctuary in the judgment hour. Thus was formed the nucleus of the, de the de definite Advent movement of the prophecy. We see the various special factors all having their roots in 1844, and from that day to this, the people of the prophecy have been hastening on toward all nations with the gospel message of preparation to meet the Lord. But the problem is they're not preaching the gospel. They're not. So we see that there is no biblical foundation for this movement at all. Do you see that? So far we've seen no biblical foundation. I want to give you some verses here. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. And we covered these earlier, but I want to read them to you again. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they're of God, because many false prophets are gone out of the world. Now, I don't think anybody tried those spirits. I think they just believed what the spirits told them. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world. And then, of course, this one. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Do you think that there's some seducing spirits in this and some doctrines of devils all over this? See, this is why you don't play with dreams and visions and all that other stuff. This is why you stick to the Scriptures. Okay? This is why you try the spirits. Well, finally, David Cloud says this in, in the wayoflife.org encyclopedia there. Finally, the visions of Hayes and Foss and Ellen White were added to this heretical stew. Hayes and Foss was not dealing with the God of the Bible. The gifts and callings of the true God are without repentance. Stubborn prophets and ministers are dealt with as rebellious children under, and brought it to repentance as Jonah was, but their gifts and calling remain. Even though poor Hazen Foss repented and heartily agreed to obey the visions, he was rejected by the angel and told that he had grieved away the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the New Testament believer is sealed by the Holy Ghost under the day of redemption. Praise the Lord, he cannot be grieved away. The angel that dealt with Hazen Foss was a liar. He was a deceiving spirit, a fallen angel under the commandment of the father of lies. The devil, the religious movement that has risen upon the visions of this angel is as deceitful and false as he is. A closer look at the role of Ellen G. White's visions in the formation of the SDA, we find this. Ellen White's father, Robert Harmon, was a follower of William Miller. Okay? As a result of their acceptance of Adventist theories, the Harmons, Ellen included, were dropped from the membership of the Methodist Church in Portland, Maine in 1843. So the Methodists were like, you're out of here. Ellen made a personal commitment to Adventism during a sermon by Miller. At the age of 17, she began receiving visions concerning this movement. So she started seeing these visions at about 17. This began soon after October 8, 1844, the last date that had been set by Miller. And in these visions, many Adventists saw the leading hand of God in answer to their bewilderment and desperation. The teenage girl was allegedly commanded by the revealing angel. Okay, so here we come in with an angel now. Now listen. They, she talks, she's gonna, you're going to hear in the, in the later writings, we go through this, she's going to talk about a watcher and, a, and an angel, a watcher and an angel and visitor and all these other things. As if it's normal that these, that these angels, that she calls them, come and visit her. Because obviously, I mean, the word of God is not enough, right? God, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, right? The holy man of God spake as they're moved by the Holy Ghost. This word, all-sufficient word, is not enough. We need Ellen G. White to have a special vision. Because we can't trust the more sure word of prophecy. Amen. The teenage girl was allegedly commanded by the revealing angel to proclaim the visions to others. And as she did so, a following of Adventists rallied around her as a prophetess of God. Seventh-day Adventism was guided both in its doctrine and practice by this female voice believed to possess the gift of prophecy and to be, in, and in, listen, listen to what they said about her, to be an inspired commentator of Scripture. 
Note the following quotation from an SDA publication. Ellen Harmon married James White on August 30th, 1846, and became a Sabbath keeper soon after. The Whites had four children, all boys, and they worked together to establish the Adventist movement until James' death in October 1881. Often James and Ellen would speak at the same meetings. Ellen lived and labored for 34 years following James' death. Eleven of those years were spent in Europe and Australia helping establish the SDA movement in those continents. Mrs. White was involved in an aggressive public speaking ministry. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. I thought the Bible said something about that. Oh, well, hey. But she had a vision. So, I'm sorry. But she had a vision. She had a dream. She had a vision. She had an angel come to her and tell her that there's another gospel. Mm -hmm. Said that you don't have to obey all that other stuff in the Bible. You just need to follow this. Ellen White was often invited to address those who attended important gatherings of the church. She reached her largest audiences. She met literally thousands of speaking appointments. This official Seventh-day Adventist publication is distributed with an advanced correspondence course, which is sent to those with more than casual interest in the denomination. The author took this course in the late 1970s. The book is also sold in Adventist bookstores. So it was, it was, it was recorded how much preaching she did. Now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 11, please. I want you to see what the scriptures say to Ellen G. White and the Seventh-day Adventists. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 11. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. That's the place where she's supposed to be. That's telling you she's supposed to be a keeper at home and God will protect her and take care of her when you follow his order. You believe that? Amen, I do. I believe the Bible. All right. Well, he said here, what did he say here? He said, he said that the woman was deceived. Now, could somebody help me out? Who was the woman deceived by? Was it someone that came as an angel of light? Was it someone that came to her? And had a message of knowledge for her? Was she not deceived by that? So this Seventh-day Adventist woman, was she not deceived by the angel? What did the angel do? He told her that, well, he told her that she didn't have to follow God's order, just like Satan told Eve. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Wait, for somebody that preached the law all the time, like Ellen G. White did, you would think that she would have understood that law. But apparently she didn't. All right? And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Let them ask their husbands at home. How about that? Very clear, isn't it? For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Wait, so this angel from heaven led her to speak in church and to usurp authority over men and to be the channel, which, by the way, she used on more than one occasion in her, in her writings, that she was a channel. Throughout her life, during the 70 years between 1844 and 1915, Miss White supposedly received approximately 2,000 visions and dreams. 2,000 visions and dreams. She said she was commanded to write her visions for preservation, and in the fulfilling this charge, she produced over 100,000 handwritten manuscripts, pages from which were published 54 books. Wow. Throughout her life, Ellen White and her denomination were guided by these profuse visions, which she received usually at night. Imagine that. 
Though these, she was instructed, through these, she was instructed concerning, number one, the supposed divine origin of the Adventist movement. Isn't it funny? God never had a church that was doing right all these years. So God brought somebody along in 1844 and had to show them that every, hey, for the last 1844 years, you guys have been doing everything wrong. There's no church, right? There's no church. The Seventh-day Adventists are coming and they're going to fix everything for you. Okay, so everybody was wrong for 1800 years. You're the right one. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, number one, the, the supposed divine origin of the Adventist movement. Number two, the investigative judgment. Number three, the importance of Sabbath worship. Number four, the SDA health movement. Number five, the Adventist literature outreach. Number six, the Adventist school system. Number seven, even the financial system and ecclesiastical organizations of the SDA church. So that's the 2000 visions can, were covered all those things. Well, this is where... You and I must do our own investigation, see just what, what, what was with this unscriptural woman's practices and what's the history surrounding her husband. And look at the Masonic mystery, the Babylonian language that's sprinkled through her writings. According to her, she was shown all these doctrines, not from the scriptures, but from visions. you understand that? One of Ellen White's visions is offered as proof for this. I want to read you some of her visions here. In the most holy place, she saw the ark that contains the law and was amazed to note that the fourth, the Sabbath commandment, shone above them all. For the Sabbath was set apart to be kept in honor of God's holy name. There was also shown in her the Sabbath, the significance of the Sabbath observance. We're going to talk about that on Wednesday. But basically what she's saying is, is that the Sabbath changed and she was the one that God gave the message to. Oh, you didn't know? You didn't know about that? Yeah. She says, well, listen, guys, God told me the Sabbath has changed. Wait a minute. Okay. What were the methods by which Ellen White received her messages? I want to read you some of these. Included in Mrs. White's biography, Messenger to the Remnant, are six pages of testimonies from various people who allegedly witnessed her visions. These are included in the biography to establish confidence in their supposed divine origin. <laughs> Some of these testimonies are descriptions of medical examinations that were allegedly conducting during Mrs. White's visionary experiences. Such testimonies place a large emphasis upon the supposed fact that Mrs. White did not breathe during her visionary experiences. Was she a fish? Anyway, uh, general phenomena. For about four or five seconds, she seems to drop down like a person in a swoon or one having lost his strength. She then seems to be instantly filled with superhuman strength. That's right. Super something. Anyway, so she had superhuman strength. So she dropped down and whew, she came up like Superman or something. And she had all this power. Sometimes rising... It says, sometimes rising at once to her feet and walking about the room. That's, that's normal. There are frequent movements of the hands and arms pointing to the right or left as her head turns. I would give anything to have seen that. I'm sorry, but I would have. Anyway, I'm going to keep going. But I, I... <laughs> Exactly. It does remind you of that, doesn't it? Todd Bentley's wife, Radical Elephants. You probably don't know what that is, but. Good, if you don't. Uh, these are frequent movements of the hands and arms pointing to the right or the left as her head turns. All these movements are made in the most graceful manner. Of course. In whatever position the hand or arm may be placed, it is impossible for anyone to move it. So you guys couldn't come up there and move her arm. She had superhuman strength. She probably could break change. You're probably right about that. Her eyes are always open, but she does not wink. No winking. How do you keep your eyes open without winking that long? Demonic, that's why. Her head is raised and she is looking upward. Not with a vacant stare, but with a pleasant expression. Only differing from the normal in that she appears to be looking intently at some distant object. You mean, she, you think she might be focusing on, on an object or something? Focusing on something? No breathing, says M.G. Kellogg, M.D. I'm quite certain that she did not breathe at that time while in vision, nor in any of the several others 
which she had when I was present. A lighted candle was held close to her eyes, which were wide open. Not a muscle of the eye moved. He then ex examined her in regard to her pulse and also in regard to her breathing, and there was no respiration. <laughs> exactly. No blinking, no breathing. Holding heavy Bibles, as they closed this part of the examination, she arose to her feet, still in vision, holding a Bible high up, turning from passage to passage, quoting scripture, quoting correctly, although her eyes were looking upward and away from the book while in vision. So in other words, she didn't know what, she, she was just, she would flip the pages like this would flip and she would quote from that page. But she was looking like this. Quoting correctly, although her eyes were looking upward and away from the book, while in vision, Ellen Harmon stepped over to a bureau upon which rested the large volume 18-pound family Bible. Have you ever seen those? I've got one at home. Uh, the binding of one of them is like this thick, and it's about this big. It's huge, okay? It's, it's like this big. It's, it's humongous, okay? It's just really, have you ever seen one of those? It's huge. Okay. Anyway, so they say here, uh, she picked it up, placed it on her left hand, and then extended it at arm's length, held the closed book with ease for a half an hour. Under ordinary circumstances, she was unable to pick up this book, for she was in frail health, and at that time weighed only 80 pounds. She was in no way fatigued by the experience. Yeah. Mrs. White's visions encouraged twisted views of Scripture to suit the SDA doctrine. The verses offered by Adventist teachers as proof texts for doctrines such as investigative judgment or Sabbath keeping in the church age is no, way, is no way to do so. No one studying these verses alone would arrive at the doctrines that the Adventists built from them. The perversions of Scripture were encouraged by Ellen White's visions and inspired interpretation. The following quote confirms this suspicion. Listen to this. Many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid my husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Elden, Elder Edison, and others who were keen, noble, and true were among those who, after the passing of time in 1844, searched for the truth as for the hidden treasure. I met with them, and we studied and prayed earnestly. Often we remained together until late at night, and sometimes through the entire night, praying for light and studying the Word. Listen to this. This is Ellen G. White talk. This is what she did, okay? And these men all just believed her. Listen to this. And again and again, these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that they might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. When they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me and I would be taken off in a vision and a clear explanation of the passage we had been studying would be given me with instruction as to how we were to labor and teach effectively. Thus light was given that helped, me, helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission, and his priesthood. A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter into the city of God was made plain to me, and I gave to others the instruction the Lord had given me. Now listen to this. She goes on to say, and I'll explain this. She goes on to say, during this whole time, I could not understand the reasoning of the brethren. My mind was locked, as it were, and I could not comprehend the meaning of the scriptures we were studying. This was one of the greatest sorrows of my life. I was in this condition of mind until all the principal points of our faith were made clear to our minds. In harmony with the word of God, the brethren knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters. Listen. And they accepted as light direct from heaven the revelation given. Now that's from Ellen G. White's special testimony. What is she saying here? She is saying that they would all be doing a Bible study. Brother Paul, let's say like six of us men were in there having a Bible study. And let's say that somebody's wife came in and you guys could, and we couldn't figure something out we were looking at. All of a sudden she would fall. She says the spirit of God would come upon her. She would fall into a trance and see a vision and God would show her what that verse meant. Yeah. And all these men, all these men would be like, yeah, that's from God. Hey, because we couldn't figure it out. I mean, what's going on there? What are they doing? Well, number one, can you show me one verse in the Bible where you need to break down into a vision and a, and a trance in order to find out what God's word means? Is there one verse in there that says to do that? Is there one verse that says that the scripture should be interpreted through dreams and visions? Is that in the Bible? That that's how you and I, 
Or do we have the Holy Ghost of God inside of us? Why does she have more of them than anybody else? So why would he take her into some extra, extra biblical thing, take her into a trance or a vision in order for them to figure out what the Bible meant? So all their tenets of the faith, they're saying, came from Ellen G. White's visions. See? She says without that, she couldn't even understand anything. So you know what she's saying, don't you? You know what she's saying? She's saying, I, couldn't, I didn't know the, anything about the Bible until I fell into this trance. When I got this vision, this trance, man, I could figure everything out. That's demonic. That is, those are, that's devils right there. That's exactly, God didn't show her anything. He showed her that. Devils gave her an interpretation and showed her that. That's not how God works. God doesn't need to do that. For, God doesn't need that to happen to any of us. We don't need that. We have the Holy Ghost of God abiding in us, and we have the words of life right here that we can interpret those things from the Scriptures. We've been given the Holy Ghost to do that. Amen. That's right. It is doctrines of devils. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Soon after this, I had another dream, she says. I seem to be sitting in an abject despair with my face in my hands, reflecting like this. If Jesus were upon earth, I would go to him, throw myself at his feet, and tell him all my sufferings. He would not turn away from me. He would have mercy upon me, and I would love and serve him always. Just then the door opened, and a person of beautiful form and countenance entered. Okay, are you into this? If Jesus were upon earth. Right? Yeah? Right. So, but Jesus is going to come to her because she's special. Okay, listen. Throw myself at his feet and tell him all my sufferings. He would, turn, he would not turn away from me. He would have mercy upon me, and I would love and serve him always. Just then the door opened. Got to love those doors open and something going on there, right? And a person of beautiful form and countenance entered. He looked upon me pitifully and said, Do you wish to see Jesus? Okay, it's a vision here. Some dude comes walking through the door. And says, "Hey, you want to see Jesus?" Uh, yeah. Just then the door opened, and the person, beautiful form and count. Man, I mean, if you can't tell this is Satan, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Okay, this is very spooky to me. All right, and these people follow this lady. Still, Alan G. White says, and they talk like that. That's how they talk. They quote her. And that's how they all talk. Like, they need some testosterone bad. Like, eat a steak and go for a two-mile swim or something, right? Or something. Yeah, that's right. yeah, they all sound like Steven Anderson. That's right, they do. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Yes, I should. Anyway, um, all right, I'm going to keep going. If Jesus were upon earth, I would, go, I would go to him, throw myself at his feet. Okay, uh, so then he opens the door. Just then the door, just then the door opens. Hey, I just said that, and just then the door opens. And a person of beautiful form of countenance entered. He looked upon me pitifully and said, Do you wish to see Jesus? He is here, and you can see him if you desire it. Take everything you possess and follow me. I heard this with unspeakable joy and gladly gathered up all my little possessions, every treasured trinket. What are you doing with trinkets? And followed my guide, my guide. You want to see my guide? This is my guide. And the Holy Ghost of God inside of me. That's my guide. God Almighty is my guide. For there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. No trinkets. As I began to ascend, or he led me to a steep and apparently frail stairway. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Okay, now Ellen G. White has a teaching in her writings, okay? about a ladder, an eight-rung ladder, okay? And she calls it Peter's Ladder, okay? She calls it Peter's Ladder. Now, you all know what that eight-rung ladder is, right? I mean, does anybody know about, if you know anything about, about the occult, if you understand this, some say it's seven, seven, some say it's eight steps. I'm not sure. She tries to liken it to add to your faith virtue and your virtue knowledge to knowledge temperance. That's what she calls it. But she says, we all must ascend Peter's Ladder. Yes, it is Masonic. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. 
I, I, we might wait till after the break, though, we come back. As I began to ascend the steps, he cautioned me to keep my eyes fixed upward, lest I should grow dizzy and fall. Many others who were climbing the steep ascent fell before gaining the top. Finally, we reached the last step, and I stood before a door. Here my guide directed me to leave all the things that I had brought with me. I cheerfully laid them down. He then opened the door and bade me enter. In a moment, I stood before Jesus. There was no mistaking that beautiful countenance, that expression of benevolence and majesty could belong to no other. His gaze rested upon me, and I knew at once that he was acquainted with every circumstance of my life and all my inner thoughts and feelings. I tried to shield myself from his gaze, feeling unable to endure his searching eyes, but he drew near with a smile and laying his hand upon my head said, Fear not. The sound of his sweet voice thrilled my heart and with a happiness it had never been before experienced. I was too joyful to utter a word, but overcome with emotion, sank prostrate at his feet while I was lying helpless there. Scenes of beauty and glory passed before me and seemed to have reached the safety. And I seemed to have reached the safety and peace of heaven. At length, my strength returned and I arose. The loving eyes of Jesus were still upon me and his smile filled my soul with gladness. His presence awoke me in a holy reverence and an inexpressible love. My guide now opened the door and we both passed out. He bade me to take up again all the things I had left without. This done, he handed me a green cord coiled up closely. Why did he hand her a green coiled up cord? And he, this he directed me to place next to my heart. And when I wished to see Jesus, Take it from my bosom and stretch it to the utmost. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. Um, uh, it, it remained coiled for any length. Okay. And, and it stretched to the utmost. He cautioned me not to let it remain coiled for any length of time. Now, I'm going to show you this. This is a cultic, what she's saying here. And I'm going to show you it is. Lest it should become knotted and difficult to straighten. I place the cord near my heart and joyfully descended the narrow stairs, praising the Lord and telling all whom I met where they could find Jesus. Where? In a green coiled cord? Where? Come with me in my vision? Listen. What does the coiled green cord represent? And why was Ellen given that, this cord? She was to take it from her bosom and stretch it to the uttermost. Then she would see Jesus. Now read the following passages and you'll understand what the green cord is what it will do. In kundalini, which means the coiled one, okay, is the invisible holy energy that yoga, yogas believe resides at the base of our spines, coiled just like a snake in the equally invisible energy center, the chakra, close to the coccyx. A biographical book, Ellen G. White gives the secret signs. Anyway, I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop here, okay? And we're going to finish it the next after lunch. But listen, that green coiled cord, I want you to look at a few things here. Now, first of all, you have a green coiled cord. That is, remember that snake that we talked about that all the charismatics have? It's down in their, in their bottom and it has to come all the way up to the top and it has to come through all the levels. Okay, what did, what did she say? She said she ascended a ladder and she said she had a green coiled cord. That is all esoteric. All of that stuff is, what she said, what she was saying there had esoteric meanings. She's talking about ascent. You ever heard of the ascended masters? You ever heard of ascension up to and that, that we will become as gods? Have you ever heard that before? That's the same type of occultic language that she is using there. Those symbols mean something. First of all, a green coiled up cord, keep it next to your heart and pull on it when you want to see Jesus. What is he, a genie in a bottle to you? Wrap this coined, this coiled cord. It's ridiculous. What is it? It's devilish. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We're going to get into some more Masonic language and some other things that are sprinkled in her writings. And wait till you see what kind of what the picture I show you here that she she and her husband drew and put in their books, had drawn and put in their books. Wait till you see it something. All right, Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray that you'd bless us now. Uh, bless our dinner, Lord. Help us to have a good time in fellowship. Help us to come back. And Lord, as 
we go through some of these things, we understand that we can prove them wrong with the scriptures. But Lord, there are people that are stuck in sin. They are stuck in these cults. And Lord, if even this message reaches one person's ears, or if you and I, if, if those in this room can take that message and that truth and give it to somebody, that they could be pulled out of that fire and come to know Christ and be forgiven of their sins and cleansed of their unrighteousness and born again. It's worth it all, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to be used of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.